Hello, this is Bikan Baskurt, Professor of Medicine from Baylor College of Medicine. It's my pleasure to present the update on 2022 American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology and Heart Failure Society of America guidelines for the management of heart failure. These are my disclosures. The new guidelines, we classify the ejection fraction very similar to the universal definition of heart failure, which was published last year, as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction uh, for those individuals with ejection fraction less than 40%, heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction with EF between 41 to 49%, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with EF equaling or greater than 50%, and heart failure with improved EF with a baseline EF in the HEFREF range and the subsequent EF greater than or equal to 40%. And please note that the elevated filling pressures are emphasized for patients with EF over 40%, including those with mildly reduced and preserved EF. Elevated filling pressures can be defined by non-invasive methods such as elevated natriuretic peptide levels, or non-invasive imaging, or by invasive hemodynamic characterization. The treatment of symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction now includes four classes of foundational therapies, including SGLT2 inhibitors, along with beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, RAS inhibition with ARNI in NYHA class two to three, or ACE or ARB in NYHA class two to four heart failure patients as step one. After optimization of these therapies, if patients remain symptomatic, hydralazine and nitrates are indicated in African-American or black patients and device therapies such as ICD and CRT are to be considered in individuals with low EF. Once guideline-directed medical therapy is optimized, other additional therapies such as ivabradine has a class 2A, verisiguat, digoxin, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and potassium binders in patients with hyperkalemia while taking RAS inhibitors have class 2B indications. Additionally, surgical revascularization is indicated among select patients with suitable coronary anatomy, and ischemic cardiomyopathy, and transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair can be considered among patients with secondary mitral regurgitation, suitable anatomy, um, elevated PA pressures, and optimal ventricular size specifications after optimization of guideline-directed therapy. Wireless monitoring of PA pressures by implanted hemodynamic monitoring has a class 2B recommendation. In patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, i.e. those individuals with EF between 41 and 49%, SGLT2 inhibitors have a class 2A indication, and ACE inhibitors, ARB, ARNI, MRA, and beta blockers have class 2B recommendations. In patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, SGLT2 inhibitors again have a class 2A recommendation. ARNI, MRA, and ARB have class 2B recommendations. Beta blockers are not included in recommendations for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In heart failure with improved ejection fraction after treatment, guideline-directed medical therapy should be continued to prevent relapse of heart failure and LV dysfunction, even in patients who may become asymptomatic. In patients hospitalized with heart failure, we emphasize the congestion and cont continuation of guideline-directed therapies. And very importantly, guideline-directed medical therapies should not be routinely discontinued in patients experiencing mild decrease of renal function or symptomatic reduction of blood pressure during hospitalization should not be withdrawn from therapy during hospitalization. If truly necessary to discontinue, GDMT should be reinitiated and further optimized as soon as possible. 
Initiation of guideline-directed medical therapy is a class one indication during hospitalization after stability is achieved. We also have recommendations for cardiogenic shock, which include consideration of temporary mechanical circuitry support, management by multidisciplinary team, placement of a PA catheter to define hemodynamic subsets, and triage to centers that can provide temporary mechanical circuitry support for patients who are not rapidly responding to initial shock measures. Similar to the universal definition of heart failure that was published last year, stages of heart failure are revised in the guidelines and defined as at risk for heart failure for stage A, defined as patients at risk for heart failure, but without current or prior symptoms and or signs of heart failure, or without structural, functional, or biomarker, biomarker cardiac abnormality. Pre-heart failure for stage B, which we define as patients without current or prior symptoms or signs of heart failure, but with evidence of either structural or functional heart disease or elevated natriuretic peptide levels or elevated cardiac troponin, especially in the setting of exposure to cardiotoxins. So abnormal biomarkers can define pre-heart failure. The third category is heart failure or stage C for patients with current or prior symptoms and or signs of heart failure caused by structural and or functional cardiac abnormality and advanced heart failure or stage D patients. There are specific recommendations for, for stages A and B, including a class one recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitors for patients with type two diabetes and cardiovascular risk to reduce heart failure events. And there are class two A recommendations for natriuretic peptide-based screening in patients at risk for heart failure. We also have class one recommendations for optimal control of blood pressure in patients with hypertension and heart failure, optimal management of cardiovascular disease, genetic screening and counseling in patients and families with genetic or inherited cardiomyopathy, multidisciplinary evaluation for patients with exposure to cardiotoxic agents, and lifestyle modification for heart failure throughout the continuum. We also have specific recommendations for comorbidities, including class one recommendations for optimal treatment of hypertension in patients with heart failure and hypertension, SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with diabetes, a class 2A recommendation for IV iron replacement therapy in patients with iron deficiency, anticoagulation as a class one recommendation in select patients with heart failure with atrial fibrillation, and a class 2A recommendation for atrial fibrillation ablation in patients with heart failure and symptoms attributable to atrial fibrillation. AV nodal ablation with CRT implantation is a class 2A recommendation in patients with atrial fibrillation and left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50% if rhythm control strategy fails or is not desired and the ventricular rates remain rapid despite medical therapy. We have a diagnostic and treatment algorithm for cardiac amyloidosis, which entails checking of monoclonal light chains and if negative, technetium pyrophosphate scintigraphy, and in patients for whom the transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis is made, genetic testing with TTR gene sequencing, and a recommendation with tetramere stabilizing therapy with tefamidus in patients with ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. In patients with cardiovascular risk factors or cardiac disease, being considered for cardiotoxic anti-cancer therapies, baseline evaluation and monitoring of cardiac function have class 2A recommendations, and serial measurement of cardiac troponin have class 2B recommendations. We also have specific recommendations for heart failure and pregnancy, including patient-centered counseling 
a class 2A recommendation for anticoagulation in peripartum cardiomyopathy, and class 3 or potential harm with ACE inhibitors, ARB, ARNI, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitors in women with heart failure who are pregnant or planning for pregnancy. We also have recommendations for vulnerable patient populations at risk for health disparities. In these patients, heart failure risk assessments and multidisciplinary management strategies should target both known risk factors for cardiovascular disease and social determinants of health as a means towards elimination of disparate heart failure outcomes. And evidence of health disparities should be monitored and addressed at the clinical practice and at the health system levels. So in summary, we have expanded the foundational therapies in patients with heart failure with reduced EF now to include SGLT2 inhibitors along with beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and RAS inhibition with ARNI or ACE inhibitors and R. In patients with heart failure with mildly reduced EF, SGLT2 inhibitors can be beneficial to reduce heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular mortality. And in these patients with heart failure with mildly reduced EF, beta blockers, ARNI, ACE inhibitors, R or MRAs may be considered to reduce future heart failure hospitalizations events, especially among patients with EF on the lower end of the spectrum. And that's a class 2B recommendation. In patients with heart failure with preserved EF, SGLT2 inhibitors can be beneficial to reduce heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular mortality. That's a class 2A recommendation. In selected patients with heart failure with preserved EF, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARNI may be considered to decrease hospitalizations, particularly among patients with EF on the lower end of the spectrum of heart failure with preserved EF. In patients with improved EF after treatment, guideline-directed therapies should be continued to prevent relapse of heart failure and LV dysfunction, even in patients who may become asymptomatic. Thank you for the opportunity to present and thank you for your attention.